Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Confessions by the Mafia Hairdresser. This podcast is filled with episodes of my true confessions, harrowing, horrifying, and sometimes uplifting stories about my hair clients and celebrity friends, and of course, all about my mom issues. This podcast is brought to you by the demons in my head, the angels who told me I should do this podcast, and all the signed and unsigned permission release forms from everyone I mention in this podcast. This is your host, John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser, author of the novels Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods, and the upcoming book murder there's an app for that all based on my fantastical crazy life you can listen to the serial podcast version of novel one and novel two here at the mafia hairdresser chronicles and wherever you listen to to here at the mafia hairdresser chronicles and wherever you listen to podcasts and both the books and the hit podcast along with this one how i killed my mother are available at mafiahairdresser.com and now on with this episode of how i killed my mother This one's called A Karen Story. On March 5th of 2020, almost everyone on planet Earth came under a lockdown mandate because of the pandemic outbreak of COVID. Businesses, banks, hotels, restaurants, and salons were all required to close until further notice. The exact date we would be allowed to open again depended on each individual city, state, or region's number of people who tested positive for COVID and the availability capacity and available beds in hospitals. I lived in Chicago at the time, and our test positive numbers were always weighed down because the majority of us always wore masks in public, and most of us obeyed our city government's instructions of do not leave your home unless it was for essential items such as food and toilet paper. But around that time, we also began to see a surge of a certain type of individuals who would pop up in our scrolls and our notifications in the news and social media portals. And those individuals were labeled Karens. A Karen was a pejorative term used for predominantly white women who demanded to be treated as privileged, royal, and entitled They thought of themselves as above reproach. Karens showed up in the news as screaming, shouting ladies who demanded more than their fair share of packs of toilet paper rations at the group in society and the color of their skin that they had the right to take up space in public parks, beaches, and the front lines of anywhere, and her perceived poor or lesser than human beings of a different race or color or social standing had to be behind them or away from them and out of their space. YouTubers began to post phone camera captured Karens getting kicked off of airplanes because of their alternative facts and reactions reality and their chosen non-belief in COVID or masks, as well as demanding more than their fair share of overhead bin space for their suitcases and carry-ons and coats and loose bags of food, holiday presents, or golf clubs. And I saw my own fair share of Karens in Chicago. But one personal Karen story stands out in my mind, and that is a tale about a longtime client of mine. I'll call her Cal about a longtime client of mine. I'll call her Catherine because that's her name. Catherine had been coming to me for haircuts and blowouts and highlights and bass bumps, which is just color on the roots, for over 12 years. I knew Catherine since her twin children, a boy and a girl, were three years old. Catherine was not what I called a rich woman. After all, I have friends and clients who are millionaires and billionaires. But Catherine was married and well off enough not to have to hold down a nine-to-five job herself. And she could regularly regularly fly um, with her whole family to exotic places around the world for expensive vacations. And she had a nice car and all that shit. And she sent her kids to the best private schools in Chicago. Her time was her own and she got to raise her kids and do her, her homemaking skills as well as hostess. Uh, Catherine catered a girls night out in her home and I was invited to a few of those and I attended them. She had like a four story single plot home in Wrigleyville. 
And I recall showing up in a bar one time when she threw her husband a birthday party. And that was nice. I just dropped in and said hi. I like him very much. But that was about all I did with Catherine socially outside the salon. But inside the salon was... She was very generous to me uh, during my birthday and holidays. And I'll never forget that one Christmas when Catherine brought me not one, but two huge bottles of Grey Goose vodka that were encased with two Grey Goose em- emblemed glasses in each box. I was like, oh my God, you got me two life-size, life-size bottles of vodka? And she says, well, as she was laughing, she says, I couldn't just buy you vodka and only two glasses. And I thought that was so cute. And Catherine always tipped well after her every three week color touch up appointments. And she was color touch up appointments and she was smart and funny. And I always enjoyed our conversations. We got on well as hairdresser and client. Now, my apartment at the time was a one bedroom on the 34th floor of a high rise on Walton and Michigan in the Gold Coast of Chicago. And my living room had no couch, TV, or dining room table like most one bedroom apartments would have in their living space. Instead, I had a huge door that rested on filing cabinets, which made into a large table where I had three computer screens. And it was there that I wrote my books and edited my podcasts. And um, whenever I was doing hair, that's what I did. And the entire rest of the living room had been at set up as modular, adaptable social media studio, complete with lights and backdrops and even a sound booth that I could use to record my podcasts. Um, um, There was a meeting table and I had chairs where I could could consult with my social media clients because when I first moved in there, I was also doing video content as well as social media content and social media consulting because... um, when Mafia Hairdresser, the book came out, I was the only hairdresser uh, guy that wrote books and people didn't know how to use Twitter. Nobody was on Twitter and Facebook. So I became a consultant in my industry. And that was before I podcasted and um, kept, and I kept my hair schedule the whole time too, because I kind of need to do hair or I, I don't like living. Now, in the sister building next um, to my apartment building was a commercial building uh, where I rented out a one-room salon suite. So, as you might imagine, it was a logistically easy way to run two or three careers simultaneously, and I never had far to walk to switch gears to do my switch gears to do my other jobs. But when lockdown occurred, we hairdressers were not allowed to do clients in our salon suites or salons for what turned out to be only three months. And the poor California hairdressers had to stay out of their salons and do hair outside for closer to a year. Ugh, poor California. The media and the talk on the street voiced concern about how all the non-corporate workers and service professionals like waiters and hairdressers were going to suffer financially because our incomes depended on daily customers and tips. And I know there was a stimulus check and I got those. Great. Thank you very much. I did not suffer financially during lockdown because the salon um, suite franchise owner I rented from did not charge us any rent during those three months we were locked out that was a phoenix salon suite franchiser and that was generous additional equipment upstairs into my home office apartment and i performed my hair services on my clients in my apartment without missing a beat Um, it was at that time that i began to save up enough money to move to florida which i'll tell you about in another episode A few of my clients were concerned that I was suffering financially from the lockdown and they zelled me money, which I gladly took and thanked them for. Even my client, Catherine, zelled me $400 as a gift. Only I did not know it. I had seen that money come through into my bank account, but instead of Catherine P., The name of the sender came up as Catherine C., which was Catherine's birth name and premarital last name, which I didn't know or remember at the time. And coincidentally, I did do a Kathy P. client in the week or two preceding that gift. So I credited that Kathy P. P. with a 
with the $400 gift and promptly sent her a thank you note. As the three months working out of my apartment began to come to an end, I knew, and everyone else in the world also knew, that hairdressers were going to go back to their salons, albeit with a few restrictions, such as how many people could be in the salon or salon suite at one time. And they knew that... um this is all the scuttle, all social media knew that we hairdressers were going to be slammed with clients pouring back into the salons to get their long overdue haircuts and overgrown roots touched up. A full month and a half before I moved all of my hair color and hair equipment back down to my salon suite, I had texted and I emailed all of my clients whom I had continued to do during the lockdown, as well as those clients who had been too afraid to come to me during that time. I warned instructed, required, cajoled, advised, demanded, and begged all of them to schedule their hair appointments, their summer appointments, immediately. I was already pretty booked up before I sent out word, but once the lockdown officially ended, I knew that I was going to be extremely busy. Unfortunately, Karen, I mean Catherine, was not one of the clients who heeded my text or emails. About a week before the lockdown ended, I received a text from Catherine. She wanted me to cut her son's hair for his junior high school graduation. Sadly for him and her, I had to decline. I I had no room in my schedule to accommodate a young man's haircut. I already had a cancellation and I didn't even think to add him to it because it was a last minute appointment she was asking for and he was a kid. I was never going to find time to cut his hair before his junior high school graduation, which to me wasn't a real thing anyway. When I was done with junior high school, we didn't even have a graduation. That was for high school or college. When I texted Catherine I couldn't do her son's hair, she threw a fucking fit. At first, she only texted. And these are just a few of the snippets of her sentences that she texted to me. Um, She said, after all the things I've done for you, And she said, I expected that you would cancel someone else's appointment because I've been coming to you for so long. And she said, "Um, this is very important to my son. You know how fragile he is, exclamation point. And she said, I've had you in my home and this is how you treat me. A lot of exclamation points and a question mark. And that was just a few sentences in her text to me. So I called her, and that's when she called me an overpriced asshole, which did not hurt my feelings at all. I could sometimes be an asshole, but I never was to her, and I was a moderately expensive hairdresser. But what did hurt my feelings was that she said, I gave you $400 which entitles me a little bit more respect than you give your other clients. And over the phone, that stopped me cold. I was like, what? I have no idea talking about Catherine. But Catherine hung up on me before she could explain. Her text was long and it was vile. And the phone conversation was short and it was also vile. Yet I felt awful because I have a service person's demeanor and personality. I certainly would always want to accommodate my customers. So I felt bad I couldn't do her son's hair, even though logistically I shouldn't have felt bad for not doing her son's hair. And he was not a regular person I did hair for anyway. And if her son, his haircut, and his fake event were so important, it was Catherine's responsibility to make an appointment ahead of time like I begged her to do. 
Catherine's son was not a young man I even liked. He was the kind of insecure boy in junior high school you would smell fear on. And in junior high school, when boys are starting puberty, the wimpy ones were the kind you just wanted to pick on for reasons you were gone for reasons you were too immature to understand at that age. And Catherine's daughter, the boy's twin sister, was super more popular than her insecure brother. And both Catherine and the daughter thought of the boy as a loser. And both of them unknowingly projected that onto him, which frankly further made him into a wimpy kid anyone would want to slam into a locker. Catherine also allowed the boy to follow and watch way too many depressed teen influencers on YouTube so that he became a self-diagnosed, depressed, sexually questioning, confused, and whiny, rebellionous child. So over the years, I listened to Catherine lament so much about that boy that when I did see him for cuts about once a year, I should have felt more sorry for him, but he was exhausting. Anyway, after I refused to do the boy's hair in text, text and emails, and Catherine became super pissed off about the whole thing via text and emails, it was my call to Catherine that, that, you know, made me feel bad about not taking him in. But then I also figured out that Catherine P and Catherine C and the $400 was from her. I felt bad that I couldn't accommodate the boy's haircut. But even worse, I felt horrified because I had not thanked Catherine for the money and I had thanked the wrong person. When someone does something nice, you thank them. My mom taught me that. But almost immediately, my guilt turned to sadness, then disappointment in Catherine. Over the phone, she had pointed out to me that she had me in her home and that she had sent me money and because she tipped me well and bought me Christmas presents and gave me a stimulus check, that entitled her to ask me to cancel someone else's appointment so that I could do her shitty son's hair. That call sickened me. Catherine was a, Catherine was a Karen and I didn't like her anymore. And I knew that I didn't want her money either. So I wrote her the following snail mail. And in that letter, I included that check for $400, which she cashed. This is that letter. Dear Catherine, thank you very much for the financial gift of support, $400. I'm not sure what online post of mine encouraged such a sweet gift. Maybe it was the lament that I posted stating that I didn't believe the government would give me an unemployment or a loan or a stimulus check. P.S. I got the Trump signed stimulus check. But anyway, thank you. I am very sorry I didn't see the Zell gift on April 24th. I was horrified to find out from you that the 400 on that date was from you. It came in as Catherine P and I immediately accredited it. She goes by is not Catherine and her last name starts with P. I know, stupid. She must be wondering why I sent her a thank you note last month. No doubt. Of course, I am an idiot. I didn't connect it to you. In my weak defense, who knows what capacity my brain was working or not working at the time. I was drinking religiously every evening. The world was falling down. And yes, financially, it has been tough. Also, because we were communicating around that time and trying to get you an appointment, I just didn't connect the dots. I am also very sorry I could not fit your son in for a haircut. I certainly would have if I could have. But please read to understand. I have been taking on more and more appointments in the past two weeks. I have turned down no one. And on certain days, I have offered my services to those who have been adversely affected, to those who have been adversely affected financially, who needed a pick-me-up. Also, the memes, the news, and social media chatter about when salons open up have certainly come to fruition. Now I am masked and on my feet six hours a day at least, and that's seven days a week. Add to that, I'm still on my feet, running around, cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, sweeping up, and bussing clients' beverages and food between each client. 
You know, I have to reclean the bathroom after every visit, mine or theirs. There is stress on my back for not having a shampoo bowl, and that kind of sucks, but no problemo. I'm only 58 years old with a workable hernia. There is trash disposal, one client, one bag of trash. There's laundry and resetting the room, re-sanitizing my tools. And the chairs need to be cleaned and ready for the next person. Not to mention, I have to greet every client on the sidewalk and walk him or her in and walk him out, which we must all do from now on, especially if you live in a high rise like I do. And people are not punctual, I have to say. All of this is to help keep each of you as well as myself safe, comfortable and healthy. Moving forward, all of this, whether in my office or salon suite, will be the new normal. Furthermore, I wish everyone knew that I was also in need of water and refueling, which is food, as well as the occasional restroom break myself. I pencil in all of that time, including the surprises such as I'm in a rush or I've decided to go blonde. So when anyone asks me to go outside of my schedule or to squeeze in or use the words, use the words just one more, they are asking me to give up a meal, a pee break, or put pressure on me and my schedule and body. I cannot rush and do an artistically, personally great job. This is a people business and every situation or hair occasion is the most important to that individual I'm cutting. Or coloring. Rushing and squeezing in appointments only lessens the value of my services as well as flummoxes me enough to make a possible mistake in my process, which may have health repercussions, mine or yours or theirs. On our last text and phone exchange, I felt that there was a much non-understanding about the work that I have to do to be able to do my hair service. So, I have told you here, thanks for reading. Also, after talking with you the other day, with you the other day, I felt that your money gift or donation or financial cushion assistance was actually more of a purchase or maybe it was a procurement. Either way, it was pretty clear to me the gift made you feel you had the right to demand that I do your son's hair, which, as I have stated, would have put me under undue pressure and pushed on my boundaries of self-care and comfortability in regards to my own health and well-being, as well as the safety of my other clients. I'm not comfortable with the intention behind this money, so I am returning it to you. I'll sleep better without it, knowing what it stood for. I don't know how to reverse Zell. Sorry. So I, I put the check in the envelope. And furthermore, I think you might feel better if I returned your money as well. You certainly didn't get what you paid for. You didn't say it in so many words, Catherine. You may think this money and the haircut debacle was a blow to our relationship. That makes me feel very sad. I also feel very bad for not being able to give you what you sorely needed because I am your service person. This is what I do and I want to serve you. I feel bad for not knowing you sent the money and I apologize for that one last time. I wish you would have called me out on that a month ago and I wish you would have told me why and what that money was for. If all of this is goodbye, then I accept that. If you choose to still hang out and get your hair done, yay! I have expressed my apologies as well as any resentments I might have felt in this letter. I shan't feel the need to bring it up again. I will not hold that resentment in my heart or make things weird if you continue to come in for your hair. I love you too much for that and I would greatly miss you if you left me. I would only say, please say, please schedule ahead. Times have changed and and I'm going to do the best I can and I'm still doing my best. Love, yes really, John David. 
So, of course, I never saw Karen. I mean, Catherine, again. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of Mafia Hairdresser, The Glow Stick Gods, John David and Goliath, or more episodes of How I Killed My Mother, just go to MafiaHairdresser.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.